Good morning, everyone. This is a uh, welcome to the cell biology lab. We are doing here drug screening uh, using uh, human cancer cells. So the chemist preparing the drugs in the chemistry uh, uh, lab, and then uh, it comes here. We screen the drug using different cancer cells uh, to see the potency and the effect. <laughs> working in the cell biology. Uh, she is a master student here. We're working with me and uh, she can tell yeah. something about the cell biology. Okay. Yeah. Hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the Gunning Lab. Uh, Mulu, like Mulu mentioned, you know, the drugs are made in chemistry and then what we do is we test them. So we have cells that were uh, extracted from patients at hospitals and then we grow them here in this facility. So as you know the body temperature is 37 degrees so we have incubators that are set to 37 degrees that way um, we kind of simulate um, like uh, an environment that the cells would find in the body. Um, so we have cells and we give them glucose, we give them protein um, and many other things like vitamins and uh, growth factors. So we grow them and then what we do is we add the drug in there and we see if we're able to kill the cancer cells. Um, so we have cancer cells and then we also have healthy cells. Right? So if you put a drug in a human being, you want it to target the cancer cells and not the healthy ones. Um, so we also have healthy cells here that we also test with the drug to see is it also killing healthy cells, so, uh, right? You all want to come one by one and just have a yeah. look at, in this eyepiece. You'll be able to see the cells um, that were extracted. Yeah. So you can see the cells that were extracted from kidneys. And like I so let's go see if Bilal is available right now, then we can do like a little switch. Because then you guys can also learn how to do a BC, BCA. And so what that is, is when we purify protein, we want to figure out what the amount of protein we have. Uh, how much bacteria you have. So we'll, we'll put them in those flasks, give them some food, like give them some sugars so they're nice and happy, and put them at a nice temperature so they can rest and grow and be, eat and keep growing. And the next day we'll come in and we'll spin that bacteria down and have it in like a little, little uh, pellet paste type thing. And then we'll lice them. By lice, I mean we break them open and we extract the bacteria from them. So, sorry, extract the protein from them. So that's how we use uh, E. coli or other bacteria to take out some protein that we want, okay? And we'll change its DNA beforehand so it only pumps out protein that we need. A couple okay. experiments, um, chemistry experiments. So these experiments, disclaimer, it's not like we do these experiments every day. Um, we just wanted to show you some really cool um, chemistry experiments that, you know, kind of could kind of perk your interest in chemistry. So the first one that we are showing is called the elephant's toothpaste. And with this one, we're using hydrogen peroxide. Um, and so hydrogen peroxide, you may find it in your house. Um, but this is 30% and we're going to see kind of the breakdown of hydrogen peroxide in real time. Okay, so with hydrogen peroxide, it breaks down into water and oxygen gas. Um, and what we're going to see is that we're going to see a bunch of bubbles that form and that's going to pretty much be the evolution of oxygen gas that are trapped in, um, in bubbles, essentially, okay? So, first thing that we're going to do is we're going to add some hydrogen peroxide in this volumetric flask.
it's not because I graduated from there, but it is one of the remarkable places where you could be able to be you know, whatever you want to be. Use your potential. Uh, not, we don't see black people particularly. You know, why, why do you think the reason? Why, why don't we see a lot of black kids here? Or, or minority kids, they call us. What, what's the problem? What, what's, why? What do you think it is? Speak. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Why don't we see black, black students, black professors, as we, we should be? What do you think it is? Okay. Uh, go ahead. Uh, Because you see, before white people, like, no offense to white people. No, no, no it's not. We're not talking about just individual people, we're talking about structure. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, you, you know, we were undermined by white people. Mm -hmm. So you see, they, they, they put themselves above. Mm -hmm. So because of that, yeah. not that many black people could get it. Right. So, but in the future, of course, you know, equality will happen. Mm -hmm. it's still, there's still racism and stuff. Right. So because of that. You said racism stuff, right? Okay, is, is racism stuff? What's racism? Yeah, thank you so much. That's, I'm gonna come back to you. Right. Okay. What, 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 how does like I know I know racism exists, right? Now what else, I'm gonna challenge you. I don't tell. I don't. I don't ask you to tell me what you know the existence of racism. How does that affect? How does that impact people? People, people of color, or just like black people particularly? How does that impact? How does racism impact, for example? I mean, it discriminates them to actually go there because in the past. Because it was mainly like white people that were huh? on those higher levels, there's hmm. not enough. There's not enough like black people or any other race, so okay. it was very discriminating. Didn't see anyone of them like of their own color or of their own race. Mm -hmm. so Excellent. Not much people would be interested to go. Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody else? Who's going to talk about? Who's going to add more, more, more to this conversation? C continue. You can continue. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I have another example. It's like for a job offer. Yeah. If there's a black man who has Give his resume, yeah. and a white man gives the exact same resume. Mm -hmm. There's a higher chance for the white man to get picked because of his skin. Excellent, excellent. So right there, what you're talking about is the impact of racism, yeah. the impact of discrimination. You talk about uh, when power, basically power, operates in this very complex way. It deprives you of your right. You are supposed to be here. This is your place. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. You're supposed to be in the commerce chamber to make policies. And you're supposed to be in the political place where, where you know, you're supposed to, you know, chart your own way. But otherwise, in a way, when you when you're telling me in that sense, uh, the fact that you know, it's like oh, X Y Z places in, you know, but this is good opportunity for you. Use it. If you don't use your potential, if you don't use your access, you cannot be, be able to be in this policy making place. But at the end of the day, you end up being at the receiving end. So Dr. Mulu, to get here, she had to work a lot, right? It's not easy right? to be a scientist, particularly in a male dominated field. I, I, I say like, pretty much it's, it's a male dominated field. On top of sexism, on top of racism, there is sexism. Particularly our black women face multiple layers of you know, challenges. So what I want you to do is when you walk into this university, you are going to be faced with a lot of resistance. So you have to break the barriers. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. So you deserve to be policy makers. As I said, you deserve to be professors. You deserve to be leaders. Don't, let, don't sit there for less. It's the way you see yourself. It doesn't matter. You know, if I see you, if I misrepresent you, if I see you in a negative light, it's my problem. By the way, racism is not about black people, okay? Mm -hmm. It's not our problem. It's about race. It's about race, right? So when racism just kind of, the idea is like to put one race above the other, right? So it's not about you, it's about the problem of this, the system. Also, it's not about individual. For example, I have got biracial kids. It doesn't mean that, you know, we, we, we're looking at the bigger structure, right? the complex system. So how do we break that apart? By working hard by just, you know, stay in school, by just being here. This is, a, this is the place for you. So I'm so glad to see you here. And I just want to also say thank you for organizing this. You've been doing this such, such a wonderful thing. And yeah, if you have question, you have a lot of mentorship now, use it. I don't want my kids or kids like you to end up in jails. If you see the statistics, you're gonna end up being, you know, stopped by, by police officers disproportionately. Don't get angry, don't get mad. Talk to them respectfully, right? Whenever you just probably have, you have encounters, 
right? You just by by just looking at your skin, there is this negative assumption. Look at the media, Stereotype. stereotypical perspective. So the problem is when the stereotype becomes, you become the victim of that. Because I'm with the power. If I stereotype you as 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 a thief, as X Y Z. But you are a professor at the university, you are this. But if I just kind of label you, then that becomes problematic. Whenever you encounter such kind of things, you need to you know, respectfully engage with officers, with anybody, with low you know, abiding citizens. Right? But it doesn't mean that you have to accept that. Does that make sense? So yeah, those kind of things, part of my, my work is like that, looking at the structural racism or structural violence, which later on, once you come to the university, you will understand how deep this is. Your mom and dad, your grandpa, your grandparents, they pay the price for you to be here, for us to be here. We are just literally working on their head, their underneath. So don't let that go in vain. Right? You have to be, you know, when you become successful, they'll be so happy. Right? We'll be so happy. Tomorrow, as you grow up, make sure to just kind of enrich each other, one another. Right? I just want to say that I'm happy to see you. I'm sorry I'm late. That was really good. I even really benefited from what you were saying too. And everything that he said was completely 100%. You know, I'm someone who I've gone through the education system. My parents immigrated here from Ghana. Um, and I've seen my dad, so he's in finance. And so I've seen him, you know, work very, very hard just to get to where he was, you know, and to keep on working hard and to fight off racism. He faced a lot of racism in his career. And even me going through you know, school, undergrad to graduate school, also faced a lot of oppression. Because like he said, I'm not only black, but I'm also a female. And I'm in a male-dominated field, right? And so um, what he said was very encouraging. You know, like we live in a society where, unfortunately, you know, we are the minority. And we're going to be the minority for a very long time. And fortunately, people are going to look down on us because they have a bad perception of us already. Right. And so something my dad told me from a very young age was that, you know, in order to to be somewhat to be someone in this society, you have to work twice as hard as the white man. And it's a sad reality, but it's true. You, we that's just the way it is. We do have to work twice as twice as hard. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to get somewhere and be successful. You know, it may just take more effort, but you will get to be successful as long as you have a vision, as long as you have a dream. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to share my experience, you know, going through education system because um, some of you may look at me or may look at Mulu and ask, how did we get here? You know, like, how did we start? Um, and so for me, when I was in high school, I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do at all. So I don't know if you guys know what you want to do in life. If you don't, it's completely okay. You don't have to have it all figured out. Even now, currently, I'm still like juggling, okay, I still don't really know <laughs> where I want to work. You know, like there's just so many options. Um, but so in high school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I liked science. And so I told my parents that I'm interested in science, but them being, you know, first generation and coming here from Africa, um, if you're interested in science, you're either going to be a doctor, a dentist, you know, one of those professions. No one really goes into just research. Like, what are you doing in, in, in Ghana studying chemistry? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, what, there's not a lot of career, um, you know, a lot of careers where you just, you know, study chemistry or study a science. So um, when I told them, they're like, OK, well, why don't you be a doctor? And I was like, well, you know, being a doctor, I don't really want the lifestyle of working 24-7 and being in a hospital and like, you know, looking after pay. It's just not, it's not for me. So then um, my mom suggested dentist and I was like, okay, well, that's pretty interesting. So I went into my undergrad thinking that I wanted to be a dentist. And so I went to the University of Ottawa for biopharmaceutical science. That's where I got accepted. Um, and so that was a new program at the time where they were trying to integrate pharmaceutical sciences with um, chemistry or biology, right? So you could either go through the biology route or the chemistry route. And because I like chemistry, I went down the chemistry route. Um, and so during my undergrad, you know, I, I worked hard. Um, I tried to get as good as grades as possible. And the reason why is because I had a goal. 
and my goal was to get into dental school and so even before going to undergrad I kind of researched okay what do I need to do to get into dental school I know that I need to get really good grades I need to volunteer and have a good resume and portfolio and everything right so I had that in mind all through undergrad I worked really hard did um, well in all of my classes um, I even took some research opportunities too. So I do encourage you guys, if you have the opportunity to do a research, um, like a summer research project as an undergrad or even a co-op program, that's what I did. Um, it's a really good experience, right? Any experience you get is good experience. So um, I did that during my undergrad and then when it was time to apply for dental school, I took the pre-dental test, the DAT, and I did fairly well on that. And then I applied um, to all the schools in Canada and then I didn't get in at all. And so that was right after my undergrad, I didn't get in um, and I had no plan B, right? So I'm there after my undergrad, wasn't working, don't really know what to do with my life. Um, and then an uncle of mine, I was talking to him and he was like, you know, why don't you just do a master's to better your application to get into dental school? So um, because I liked chemistry then I decided okay let me do a chemistry master's not because I want to go into research but just to kind of help me to better my application for dental school so to apply for my master's I looked to see what research am I interested in at that time I liked um, researching or I like studying carbohydrate chemistry and so this was a course that was offered at my school and I thought it was interesting so I looked at any professors that were doing research related to that so I found a professor in Dalhousie University um, at, in Nova Scotia who was doing that and I emailed him and he accepted me in his lab and so I went there for my master's um, and so that was two years during the two years, again, I was preparing myself for dental school. I retook the DAT test, and this time I did very, very well. My grades throughout my master's were very, very good as well. Um, applied for dental school the second time all over Canada, not even an interview, nothing, right? And so imagine, like, I'm literally just doing this master's just to get into dental school, and, you know, there's nothing that's coming out of it. Um, and so I got rejected twice and so that really took a hit and I was like well I'm not going to do anything else to better my application so I'm going to have to think of something else to do with my life. So during the time when I finished my master's um, I went back to Ottawa to stay with my family and I didn't really know what I could do with my chemistry degree just because I didn't know anyone who was doing research right and so that's why it's really important to to grow your network, right? And so to know people that are doing different careers and different professions, so that if there's something that you like, you can always ask them. For me, I didn't really have anyone. I didn't know anyone that was doing research or that, that just did a science and went into you know any profession with that. Um, and so I, because I didn't really know, I didn't really know what kind of jobs I would like and what to apply to. Um, so after my master's, I ended up working at Starbucks <laughs> for like a while. And then I was teaching piano too on the side. Um, and then after like six months of doing that, um, I decided to do my PhD simply just because that was the next thing to do. Um, but then during my PhD, I actually realized that I liked science and I, and I really enjoyed you know, the research and I was curious and I had all these research ideas and everything. And so that's when I actually realized what I liked, right? And so that's just to say that, you know, you may not know, you know, what you like, but um, what you should do is just always just follow your interest, not really just, you know, think about the kind of job that you want, but just follow your interest in your education. If you find that you're interested in finance, keep on doing finance until you figure out what you want to do, right? If you find out that you're interested in bio biology, keep on doing biology, try different labs out, see what kind of research you're interested in, um, and then you'll always find a profession to match your interest. Um, that's the one thing that I learned. So going through all of that, finishing my PhD, um, I actually just finished earlier this year. Um, thank you. <laughs> so that was that was huge because at that point I had been in school for like 23 years. <laughs> so like I was, I was, I was done. Like I was, yeah. I'm even surprised I came back to a school to work because I was done with school. Um, but yeah, so all of that to say that, you know, no matter 
um, what path you take. Just always follow your interests and um, just know that, you know, the sky is the limit and, you know, society may put these limitations on you, but at the end of the day, you can always break through those limitations. Um, and one thing that I, I, I've realized too is, you know, um, before when we were talking, um, the question was asked, um, why don't we see, you know, black professors? Why don't we see black people in these high um, places? And I just wanted to add to that because I think that one reason why we don't is because um, there's not a lot of role models. Because I always think about, you know, when I was little, what did I want to be? And I remember when I was little, I wanted to either be a singer or a backup dancer because you look on TV and you see someone like Beyonce, you know, you see all these people that are admirable to you. And the people that you admire, that's kind of who you want to be like, right? But the reason why I didn't think that, you know, a PhD was attainable or being in academia was, attain was attainable be is because I didn't have a black professor. You know, I didn't have um, a black role model that was in a position that I, that I liked, you know? And so that's also to say that, you know, you may have to go out of your way to search for role models or to search for mentors or whatever, but you should definitely do it because once you have someone that you could admire or someone that you know is in a place that you want to be, you can always learn from them. You can look them up. If there's someone that you know is famous and you don't have access to them, just kind of look up their journey and see, okay, how did they get to where they are? If it's someone that you meet, you can always ask them questions, you know? Um, because the one thing I also found, or I found out along the way, is that having someone that can kind of teach you you know, the way of where to go and, you know, the obstacles that are come are, that are going to come up to prepare yourself, that also makes the journey a lot easier too. But I, uh, just to give you um, a background of how I got to be at U of T, um, I went, to, I did my undergrad actually at York. I did it in biology and then I did my master's in PhD at U of T. Right now I am at uh, uh, University Health Network. At, I work at Mount Sinai Hospital. I'm a researcher there in a research laboratory. So um, I actually, there are some things that I would have done differently if I have done it. And I think this is what I want to share with you guys. And for me, for what I am doing right now as a researcher, uh, who I work on a biotechnology platform, which is in genotyping. So I look at um, how different genotypes affect health. And to do that, like I, what I do is biotechnology. I use my biology background, yes, but I didn't need to go through PhD route to do that. I spent a lot of time, a lot of years, um, at least eight years in graduate school. Uh, before I go here, but I could have just easily gone from my master's or even before my master's after doing my undergrad There is a specialized program at Missionary Institute that allows you to do that within three years period of time These are the kind of information that I didn't have and I kind of want you guys to have so for any of you, I think if I were to give any kind of advice from what I've done um, so I would say know what you want to do. In undergrad, I would say that's your time to explore, to find out what you like. And then once you like it, first year, second year, you have enough time to say, okay, where I want to go is to medical school. So what do I have to do? Medical school, the first thing you need is the grade. You need an A average, right? So don't take like difficult courses that doesn't give you that average. You're not required to do molecular biology degree to do medical school. If you could do easier courses to have your A average, and then on the side way, do um, volunteer work at Mount Sinai Hospital, at UHN, there are opportunities at UHN, uh, for example, right now. Starting yesterday, today, and tomorrow, there is a, a tour at UHN that's open for everybody. These are the kind of things you guys uh, should identify. So you would be able to go and you, you can, anybody can register. I'll forward it to you guys. So you will have the information, for example, for next year. You could go and look at things, programs available, those kind of things. And you can, you know, then when you do your undergrad, you know what's available. Those are the kind of things you should prepare in ahead of time. Those are the kind of things I didn't have a mentor for. So had I have this kind of group 
like someone like Mulu, I would have gone to Mulu and say, well, this is the kind of things I want to do. What do you think I should do? She would have put me with somebody in the network to help me go through those kind of things. So use this network. And I think Mulu is, she started, this is not an easy thing for her to have done for the last seven years. It's growing, it's becoming more organized. And it's going to end up being very helpful for you guys if you use it the right way. So now you have opportunities. You've got role models you can look, um, you can talk to, you can, you have mentors. You can, at the very least, you can ask questions. So those are the kind of things I say, you know what you want to do before you go into it. Yes, you will you'll start a program and you'll have barriers. And I think as a black person and as a woman, you will have lots of barriers. But then at the same time, challenges could be difficult, but challenges are what propel you to become successful. And actually, just look at them as a platform. When you have challenge that other people don't have, then that means you've got a platform to go even higher. So you may not be like everybody else because of the challenge, but you will become higher than everybody else. That's how you should think. That's an opportunity for you to exit, to create, and to become your role model yourself. You'll be like somebody who's going to be opening a program that's never heard of before, because those challenges will get you there. And that's all I'm going to be saying. So if you have questions, <laughs> Um, I, I'm not here to really talk to you about science or research and you know what you should be uh, pursuing uh, in your academia in your future um, although I did come from a, a clinical science and a research background uh, I'm here today to talk to you about um, mental health and the importance of mental health more specifically in our community and I just want to say I wish I had this kind of platform when I was at your age. This is huge, uh, Dr. Mulu, and I just really want to um, appreciate and acknowledge what you're trying to do with the youth. So you guys are already a step ahead of the previous generation, which is us. Um, I actually founded most, most recently um, a mental health initiative called Ethiopian Bridge the Gap. It's for our community, the Ethiopian Eritrean youth and, and families alike. And basically it's actually born out of the, um, the needs of our community, I'm sure you've heard about family members, friends, that, you know, going through difficult challenges. And as a, as a youth and a black youth, um, an immigrant uh, community, we will face many, many challenges. I know Huati mentioned a few of them. We have systemic discrimination, we have racism, we have the generational and, and cultural um, gap between our parents, so it's kind of hard to navigate that, um, that area. And you know, all of that can have a direct impact on our mental health. And you know, there are three important things that I want you to remember as you, you know, as you navigate school and work and life in general. And those three main points are, number one, awareness. Knowledge is power and all that you do in life. And having knowledge around the, you know, around knowledge around mental health get to know the signs and, and the signs and the symptoms um, and understanding what what factors actually impact your mental well-being and when we talk about mental well-being i want you to really understand that it is just as important as your physical well-being if you have a stomach ache you will tell your mom or your dad or you you know reach out to your family physician your mental um, your mental wealth and your mental well-being is just as important as part of you the mind is not like a separate entity but you know they function in unity so when you're not yourself and you recognize that somebody else that you love and care about your friends are not quite themselves I want you to be able to recognize those things so number one is awareness and number two is reaching out reach out just like I said if you're not feeling well you'd talk to your family you would talk to a friend so reaching out is really um, very cr critical you can reach out if you can't talk to your mom you can talk to your friend if you can't talk to your friend you can reach out to um, a lecturer a teacher but it's really important to find a support and it's really important to be able to um, find what works for you so that's number two and number three is um, uh, number three is to know that you're not alone 
one in five Canadians will face a challenge, a mental wealth challenge throughout their lifespan. That's how many people in this room? Just, I mean, that's, yeah, two, absolutely, right? And if you think about it, that's one in five. So you, you're either bound to go through it yourself or somebody that's sitting next to you is bound to go through it. So by really knowing that you're not alone, just like somebody could fall down the stairs and break the leg, you can also stumble emotionally, right? But that doesn't mean that it's a weakness. It's just, it's just a way of life. It's just what it is. But like uh, Huati mentioned, and I, I didn't catch your name earlier, these are, yeah, these are just obstacles that we face and you have to see it as an opportunity to grow, to really understand and to focus um, on these um, attributes that are really important to you. Um, so awareness is number one. And number two is you're not alone. And num sorry, number two is to reach out. And, to, and number three is to know that you're not alone. And reaching out and, and asking for help is not a sign of weakness. In fact, that makes you a hero. That makes you an advocate for yourself. It makes you an advocate for your colleagues and your friends and family members. Um, yeah, I think those are the three things that I want you to really take with you as you embark on your future um, adventures. And as a community, we really want you to know this generation is rooting for you. You guys are valued, you guys are important, and um, you, know, you guys are loved. And we're here to support you, reach out, connect, and networking is the key. That's it, if you have any questions, I'm here. If you have any comments.